Good morning. So, um, I'm a hacker, I have been for a few years, and a friend of mine, also a hacker, says that keynotes is where hackers go to die. So I guess that's what's gonna happen today. Um, die is probably a bit harsh. Retire is probably more accurate. We get to talk about the things we did, and we talk about the future that we would like to see. Um, I know many of you are deeply excited about law and liability, so that's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. I apologize. Um, I remember when someone first came to me to talk to me about product liability directive in, in the European Commission. And I, at the time, I was hacking on pacemakers and uh, also industrial systems. And I was really interested in the physical effects that occurred when uh, a hack succeeded in these environments. And they said, well, what if companies were liable for these vulnerabilities? And I thought, you're crazy. That'll never happen. These companies wouldn't let that happen. The end user license agreement protects them. Um, there's not much we could do about it, right? And they said to me, why don't you look back in history? Because the same story was true about cars. Cars didn't used to be cash crash tested. They were too expensive. It was too expensive to put seat belts into cars. It was too expensive to put the brakes on the same side of the car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes by looking back hundreds of years, instead of being focused as a hacker on the next 15 minutes, we get a much more interesting and rich story uh, of the world. So today I'm going to speak to you about a couple different topics. I'm going to speak about safety, I'm going to speak about security, I'm going to speak about privacy, and I'm going to speak about liability um, in this particular presentation. Now usually I'm more comfortable with a hex dump or a bin walk than with some of these legal structures, but after uh, three or four months of working on this topic with two other experts, um, I feel a little more comfortable and I'm happy to, to talk to you about it. All right, so how does IoT change safety? A lot of times as security professionals, we ignore safety professionals. I, I didn't have that luxury because I used to work in oil and gas and electricity and water and so on. As you can see, I'm not comfortable wearing uh, you know, smart shoes. I like to wear steel cap boots because I often have to go to the plant with a hard hat and meet the safety engineers. And every time I would do a penetration test at one of these companies, I would have to go through their safety training, right? You have to understand what to do when the gas alarms go off uh, and you might be poisoned on the oil platform. Um, you need to know what to do in high winds or you know, in a shark drill in certain places in the world. And when I spent time with these people, I realized that they had a wonderful safety culture. They viewed safety as something that happened when you trained people to deal with situations. So they understood that the only way to build safety into their environment was safety culture. Now, some of these same people were barriers to my work in certain ways. I would go to do some security work and say, have you checked uh, you know, the SHA-256 of the firmware image on this particular um, safety firmware image? And they would say, what are you talking about? You know, Bob signs this little document and tells us that it hasn't been changed in three weeks. Um, so I had to work with them to understand their culture and how they built, built culture to improve the security of the environments that I was working on. So getting back to this particular topic, uh, that's, I think, why I got invited by uh, Ross Anderson and Richard Clayton and some people at the EEC to work on this particular topic, right? The gist here is that software is everywhere. We say software is eating the world, okay? Or the way I like to think about it is a while back, the internet was only lightly embodied. When it was just data, harm was virtual. But now that we're putting sensors and actuators into all sorts of things, and software is everywhere in the world, the safety implications become much, much more entangled and important. So how will we update safety regulation and safety regulators and liability regulators to cope with the security and privacy implications of the vulnerabilities and exploits that we're seeing today? That's basically the premise of this entire presentation. So let's do a little background. Uh, safety in some industries is certainly better than others. Aviation is a good example. Of course, they have a lot of money. When they do incident investigations, they don't look at a monocausal environment, they look at multi-causal situations. It might be wind speed plus pilot error plus poorly designed cockpit plus software failure. So they can accept multiple causes in a single incident that they are investigating. Um, medicine, similarly, in some cases, in surgery, you get this kind of multi-causal team approach to examining incidents. And I see many of the CERT teams in the world going in this direction as well, multi-causal. Uh, view of incidents. Cars used to be awful. 
People used to die all the time in cars. Cars were designed in different ways, right? So some of them had the brake pedal on the right, others had the brake pedal on the left. You get into one car, you know how to drive it. You get into another car, you cause an accident. It took us time and energy to build liability in that space. Luckily, here in the EU, we already have a product liability directive. And in fact, here I've given you the 1985 version. That should be also the uh, 1999 version, uh, which you can go and look up if you enjoy looking at these things. But how will we coordinate this? How will we unify this? Uh, there are over 20 EU agencies. And I'd say there's many, many more if you want to look at other players in the space that might be involved. It's going to be complicated. Luckily, the European Commission uh, is used to unifying these things. All right, let's get to the core of the issue. Is IoT a product or a service? If a dishwasher floods your kitchen, you can take the vendor to court for the damages, especially if it's a design flaw. Now, it might be a user error, but if the machine overheats and sets fire to something, you can sue somebody, right? If toys are choke hazards, you can take people to court and you can get some judgment on the quality of the uh, toy and how it was made. And as products enter the, Euro the EU, we, we check them. In fact, at most of our borders, we check them in various ways to see if they're safe. Do we do this in any cyber sense? Do we look at where the data is flowing for any individual device? Do we look at running static code analysis across any of these devices? Do we check them for vulnerabilities at the, uh, you know, at the border? No, we don't. We can't afford to. We don't have the institutions to do these things. But might we in the future is the question. And importantly, product liability has this idea of shared or proportional liability. You can say it's 20% stupid user fault and 80% design error, right? Now, I personally don't believe users are stupid. They have a right to, do, to expect products that make them safe and secure. When they buy something that contains their medical data, they don't expect it to go halfway around the world to another country that has different privacy laws. They don't understand these issues, and we shouldn't expect them to. All right, so let's return to firmware and services. We assume that there's no liability in firmware and software, zero, because of the end user license agreement, right? You give up all liability when you use something, right? Never use Java in a nuclear power plant is like part of the EULA, basically, for Java. Right. Um, but you find it. If any of you work in, in you know, nuclear fuel processing or other places, then you'll have seen some Java somewhere in the plant, right? So the difference between the real world and what we expect the real world to be is quite, quite large. So these things are assumed to be non-liable for defects, for vulnerabilities, and for exploits. Now, exploits is a little extreme. Why would you be responsible for exploits? Um, it depends. It depends on where the exploit was written, whether or not you knew about it in advance, uh, whether or not you could have detected it anywhere. For example, when you're updating IoT devices, most firmware update algorithms go something like this. Push uh, a firmware update to a device, run some sort of checksum or hash function on the firmware that I've told, you know, this is the, the firmware to expect, and then update. And that's it, for the most part, right? It's, of course, a little more complicated in practice. But what about checking the firmware that was already present on the device when you got there? What about checksumming or hashing just the firmware that was already present before you did the update? If you were a company in the world doing that, you would have some sense of how many of your products received corrupt firmware updates or had been corrupted on purpose, right? You might get some statistics about how many of your devices had had their firmware compromised. There's not really any reason not to do that except for economics. All right. Well, is this true? You know, this idea that firmware is completely uh, not liable, software is never liable in any other case. This is the EU Product Liability Directive, and I know none of you are really going to be too excited to go and read the entire thing as I was. I wasn't excited about it either. I, I would rather have been doing some hacking. But I got excited as the, as the project went on. And this is why. The liability of the producer arising from this directive may not, in relation to the injured person, be limited or excluded by a provision limiting his liability or exempting him from liability. So in other words, in our general product liability directive across the entire EC, we have a statement that says you can't just sign away all liability because of a EULA. It hasn't really been tested, but that's something you could start to think about, whether you want to live in a world where we could push this 
and discuss it with respect to firmware and software. Article 8 is also important because you might have a hacker in play, right? You might have a malicious bad actor who's deliberately compromising things. Would liability apply in that place? Certainly if someone's sabotaging something, liability couldn't apply, right? Well, Article 8 here becomes important. Without prejudice to the provisions of national law concerning the right of contribution or recourse, the liability of the producer shall not be reduced when the damage is caused both by a defect and by the act or omission of a third party. So the act of a third party here, being a hacker, may not limit liability under the European Product Liability Directive. And feel free to go and read it in your own local languages because the EC produces it in many languages, which is wonderful. Amusingly, when I was downloading this the other day, I was trying to download the English version, and I got the Greek version, uh, which I found very funny because law is all Greek to me. But, um, you know, it's just an example of how flaws in systems exist, right? All right. So the next important problem of the paper that we wrote, and there are 72 pages of that paper too, if you're, again, bored enough to go and read it. Um, one of the important points of this presentation is can exploitation be foreseen? And I've been involved in this debate for a couple of years now, and essentially every manufacturer or vendor that I ever speak to says all vulnerabilities are unforeseeable. Just out of curiosity, does anyone in this room believe that? That no vulnerability could be foreseen in products and services? No? None of you believe that a product is uh, likely to be free from defects, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of ridiculous too, right? Especially after three and a half years of testing industrial systems. The next thing they would say is, who would do that? Who would find a vulnerability in product? Why would the hackers come in the first place, right? And the answer is money, power, ego, uh, social credit, you know, these kinds of things. So. How do we know how much to spend on security? It's further up the supply chain, it's not our fault. Use a firewall. You guys have heard most of these, uh, these things before, right? So of course, if you speak to an ethical hacker, you get a much, much uh, more nuanced or, or different, or some would say extreme <laughs> uh, viewpoint, which is that all vulnerabilities can be foreseen. Of course, you should expect exploits and defects in any particular product. The incentives will arise, so don't worry about why people will hack it. Just worry about whether it's hackable. One day you'll find out why they want to hack it. Test your supply chain too. Firewalls have vulnerabilities. Antivirus has vulnerabilities. I've found a few. I've found string format bugs in you know, code running as admin in antivirus products in 2010. It's ridiculous. You buy something to make you more secure, and you end up less secure. So, how do I solve this not as a problem for everyday people? How do I capture this sense of foreseeability of exploits for someone who might not have ever written code? You know, a regulator or someone who works uh, in policy. How do I capture for them in a simple way uh, what I'm trying to say here, which is essentially some vulnerabilities are completely foreseeable. Mirai, admin, admin, default passwords, come on. That's obvious, like uh, any of us in this room would have thought of that. Um, some vulnerabilities are, you know, wonderful, right? Uh, Rowhammer really surprised me. I found that absolutely amazing. Uh, not even single vulnerability, but set of vulnerabilities to kind of look at, right? And the exploits in particular were, were fantastic. Um, what's in between? String format bugs, buffer overflow, SQL injection, all of this stuff is sort of foreseeable, right? Maybe some vulnerabilities are not foreseeable, but some of them are. Where's the dividing line? And my answer to you is tools. If a tool existed at the time that the product was created that would have found the vulnerability, then it was foreseeable. If I could have run Burp Suite at the beginning of the project to find some vulnerabilities in the embedded web server, I'm sorry, you should have foreseen that. If I could have run some static code analysis and found the buffer overflows, then the vulnerability was foreseeable. If there wasn't a tool that was created at the time that you made the product, fine, fair enough, we could consider that to be unforeseeable uh, vulnerability at that time and place. And that's the recommendation in the paper, is essentially to people who don't work in this space, if a tool exists or existed at the time. All right, so getting back to the safety and security, uh, have many of you seen this video? And we'll be applying your brakes shortly. Uh, right about now. Ooh. Yeah, that works. Ooh. Ooh. Is he going to go to the wall? <laughs>
So I think this video absolutely nails my point, right? If this wasn't a hack, if your car just started behaving this way in the real world, you would want to sue the manufacturer, right? You would say, someone has made a product that is faulty. So when it's Murphy or an accident, we accept that the vendor would be responsible for such things. But when it's hacking, we don't necessarily accept vendor responsibility. And I'm not saying the vendor is completely responsible, but they're partly responsible, right? Um, the other people responsible are here in the video. But the point is, we're going to see more and more and more and more of this in the future, where code creates consequences in the real world. As the internet becomes more embodied in the real world, the consequences will be more embodied in the real world. All right. So I was lucky to work with uh, Chris Valsack for, um, for a couple of years at IOActive. Uh, I didn't work on any of the, the G-packing or anything. I didn't touch any of the product. I only met Chris a few times. But I, I was lucky, in a sense, to, to be witness to the work that he and Charlie were doing on these same things. And um, you know, they just needed an IP address at one point to find individual vehicles, right? Or a vehicle identification number. It got quite simple the further they got into the project. The initial parts of the product, project were incredibly hard. And it took them a lot of time and energy to compromise each individual piece. But as they built up their capabilities, it sort of got more and more scaled, more and more scary, right? And eventually, Chrysler recalled 1.4 million vehicles for this uh, software fix. Well, where does this go in the future? It goes to a world where people stop worrying about the code. They put on some haptic gloves. They can manipulate the vehicle in interesting ways. And you get share prices starting to fall. Do we want to see that for lots of companies? Remember the time when breaches didn't lead to any loss in shareholder value? There were a couple of academic papers written about that 10, 20 years ago. It used to be the case. It's no longer the case. Um, people are even considering releasing exploits and vulnerabilities to short stocks deliberately to make money. Well, it's already happened. So this scales, right? Traditional car makers moving uh, towards autonomous vehicles um, allow this to happen. You have to make the vehicles ready for autonomous driving while drivers are still in them. Essentially, you have to put the network into the car and they become vulnerable. And Charlie and, and Chris sort of knew this and tested the vehicles at exactly the time when people were still driving them, but they were ready to be hacked. We've got Google, Tesla. Tesla is already doing regular updates. Um, and the big problem here is the argument is it's too expensive, right? The test rig for each individual car, a cybersecurity test rig for a car, is expensive. And it gets recycled as you build new models, right? So how will we patch these vehicles in 2017, in 2037? Will these vehicles keep running, or will it just be like Google Nest? Oh, uh, you know, we sell you this product for life, and then we shut it down, and your car no longer runs. These are problems that have to be solved, and not just by the car manufacturers, by us in society thinking about how we want to live. How many computers can you see in these medical environments? They're everywhere. And you knew that. You knew that because you're professionals, and you work in this space, and you work with other professionals. But think about that, all of these different devices and how they affect uh, someone's life and health in much the same way as cars. Does anyone know about Marie Moore, Dr. Moore? No? I've been working with her for a couple of years. She was head of, um, of, uh, CERT, of the Norwegian CERT for a period of time. Um, and she had a pacemaker, and she wanted to look into whether or not it, it was hackable. Now, Kevin Fu had already done some hacking on pacemakers. So had, uh, another friend of mine from IOActive, Barnaby Jack, did some great work in the space. And then I started working with Marie on these topics. And as I started to look at the topics, I stopped worrying just about whether or not I could exploit the pacemaker or the firmware or the programmer or the home monitoring units or whether or not you can manipulate the radio or fuzz them or do anything. And I started to think a little bit more about something very, very different, which is user errors, user interface design. So these are essentially products that do the same thing, right? And yet, look at all of these different user interfaces. Look at the layout of the numbers here on this one down here, right? As opposed to the layout of the numbers over here. So if you move from this product to this product, you need to pay attention to where the numbers on the pad are, right? Um, you need to select what units you're using. 
Sometimes you use a comma to separate uh, you know, units or a decimal, depending on which one of these products you're using. So I found the work uh, through Ross Anderson of uh, someone called Dr. Harold Thimbleby, and he looked into user interface errors in medical products that cause deaths. And he estimated in one of his papers that the number of deaths due to user interface and standardization design errors of medical devices is roughly proportional to the number of deaths from car crashes in the UK. And yet we don't have people investigating this or standardizing these different devices. And indeed, I saw the same thing when I was working with uh, Dr. Mua, right? She would go to the hospital, and they would need to reprogram her, the firmware in her, um, in her pacemaker once because a bit flip happened in the air. So she lands in another country, and she has to get the pacemaker reprogrammed because it's lost its settings. She luckily has the settings on paper. And they come into the room with a trolley full of pacemaker programmers, like one here, one here, one here, one here. And then they have to ask her what kind of pacemaker she has and use the appropriate tool for the job. It's not standardized, right? And standardization leads to errors. Imagine you're a medical professional, professional who suddenly has to understand how all these devices work. Imagine Marie comes to you as a doctor and says, hey, can you tell me about the cybersecurity and uh, the privacy of the pacemaker that I've got embedded in my body? And the doctor goes, don't worry about that. It's not a problem. That's not the world I want to live in, which is why I want to talk to you about these things. So the medical device directives are now being revised because of these kinds of things. And as I said earlier, uh, Harold Thimbleby, Dr. Thimbleby, uh, safety usability failures kill about 2,000 per annum in the UK, right? I don't know of many other studies across the EU. It's ripe for study. Go and have a look at it. Um, so get regulators to do post-approval studies and adverse event reporting. If you look into pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals have a similar um, mindset to us as cybersecurity professionals. I know you wouldn't expect it to be true, but but it, it was kind of fun being able to look at anything I wanted over three months and call people up and ask them how different things worked. And having done some penetration tests of pharmaceutical facilities, I was really interested in how they deal with pharmaceuticals in the wild, right? A lot of things can go wrong when you ship a medicine from one side of the world to another. It can be shipped improperly. It could be uh, refrigerated or not refrigerated. It could be uh, humidity could impact it in some way. Someone could steal it and replace it with counterfeit medicine. You also have the problem of contraindications with pharmaceuticals. So using this pharmaceutical at the same time as using this pharmaceutical can lead to effects that you didn't expect. So how do they deal with that? They have a, they have a system that they call pharmacovigilance. And it works reasonably well or not so well, depending on who you ask. But the basic idea is that people all around the world report adverse effects of pharmaceuticals, and then the community at large talks about it and tries to investigate some of the more important incidents to understand what was going on. Why do they do that? Because they know they can't predict all the different things that might happen. And why am I drawing this analogy? Sometimes your security flaws are because you can't interface the Cisco uh, switch with the Juniper firewall in exactly the way you want. Some vulnerabilities don't exist inside a single product. They exist between two different products in the way they interface. Integration bugs, as we used to say. That's very similar to contraindications, right? So my, my position here is quite simple. Computer emergency response teams already are a form of cyber co-vigilance. And they share incidents. And they start to understand these vulnerabilities and understand which products are leading to the most compromises. And that might play in very nicely into liability. If there's one particular product that's just out there that's causing everybody to get owned over and over and over, then within the EU, we could be talking about that. So at present, devices are typically approved on paperwork alone. They don't have people to pen test medical devices inside the regulators. And why not? Someone in this room could be doing that work here in Latvia or in Lithuania or Estonia or any other country, right? And we need more people doing this kind of work. Usability failures that kill are typically blamed on the nurse, which I find ridiculous. But attacks are very much harder to ignore. So Wi-Fi tampering demo in 2015 finally led the FDA in the US to blacklist the Hospira Simbac infusion pump. And a recall of 450,000 St. Jude pacemakers due to the shorting of stock by MedSec and Muddy Waters. 
The argument here is that software upgrades can break certification, but the FDA recently acknowledged that applying upgrades shouldn't break your medical certification. So there have been adjustments by the regulators to help people patch more, and that's the sort of thing that we need to see more of. Electricity substations, a favorite of mine for many, many years. I've slept in a few substations. I like listening to them. I know I'm a bit odd. <laughs> Um, but I like the sound of things, you know. I like um, taking all the network traffic in a data center and piping it, you know, to the speakers so that I can hear what it sounds like and what its patterns are. are. Um, it's much easier for the brain to process visual information or audio information than to look at the complexity of Wireshark dumps, right? Um, and when you listen to some of the authentication or the lack of authentication in electricity substations, and you understand their life cycle, they have the same problems that we're going to see in everything else, right? You make a product. How do you, how do you put a cipher into a product that's going to last 40 years? Can anyone name a cipher that's lasted 40 years? So we're going to have to solve these problems as society, right? As these devices switch from serial to IP, based systems, you could route through them and hack them in ways that you couldn't before. Serial was hackable even years ago, but it was only individual point-to-point -point that you could really acquire. So the IP networking in industrial systems made, made a big problem. And we're attempting to re-perimeterize. I don't think that's the only solution, uh, but it would help, right? They can't afford to replace this stuff all the time. So non-IT industries have a static approach, the safety approach, right? If it's working and it hasn't killed anybody lately, don't touch it. That's basically you know, the safety sort of culture around some of these things, unless you're dealing with a particularly talented safety team. So pre-market testing and standards change slowly, if at all. Time constants here are like a decade. Whatever you test a product, whatever standard you test a product to, you're releasing it into the world for probably 10 years, and it's not going to be updated. And this is usually our argument to this type of work. You've got to test it in situ. You've got to do red teams on individual companies at different times with different contexts. And this gets very, very expensive and requires more and more and more of us over time. And that's a good thing, because I want all of us to be employed. But, you know, we also need to worry about where society is going in the future. So our broad questions are about incidents, right? Who will investigate incidents? And how much time and energy should we spend on individual incidents? And what do we do with incidents that are involving more than one country in the EU? I don't know many attackers that sit down and go, ha-ha, I'm going to attack Latvians today and nobody else, right? They usually go after lots of people at the same time because they're opportunists. I mean, there are weird cases. I did see one piece of ransomware that only affected Germany and the Netherlands, but whatever. Um, but usually, it's opportunistic. And my point there is that we need to communicate across borders and across companies and share some of this information about who's being attacked and why. So how do we embed the, the coordinated disclosure, uh, or as most people call it, responsible disclosure debate into this discussion of safety, right? What do you do with vulnerabilities that might genuinely harm large numbers of people? How do you take that forward? in some sense, with the regulators. And my question to you is, you know, when you do your responsible disclosure, have you ever thought of speaking to a regulator? Or do you only think about talking to the company when you release the vulnerability, or maybe the CERT and the company to coordinate a vulnerability? What about the regulators? They should at least know about it, right? They should have some sense that these are the risks involved in their industry. So if you're working on railway systems, Maybe you want to have a little chat with the regulator once a year about, here's the vulnerabilities we found in systems that you might use in railways, or in telecommunications, or in hospitals. How do we bring those safety engineers and security engineers together? I've had some success with that over the years, and my argument is basically they both are working towards the same goal, a reliable system that behaves consistently. And I think security engineers can learn from safety engineers how to embed security into culture. And I think that um, safety engineers can learn from security engineers better methods of maintaining the integrity of their systems. And that will become very important. So these regulators will need security engineers as well as safety engineers, and they'll need to work together. And this is the sort of thing we hope to see across Europe entirely. It's worth talking a little bit about abusive lock-in as well, right? Lock-in can take many forms. It can take contractual forms, fiscal forms, technical forms. 
You know, the classic example is why can't I take my uh, music from my iPhone to my Linux desktop? It's technical lock-in. It's file formats. Things are not standardized. They're not exportable. And that's okay. As a reverse engineer, I love that. I love reverse engineering weird file formats. But for society in the longer run, I don't think we can just have teams of uh, reverse engineers constantly fixing all of the problems that we create. So we need to watch out for abusive lock-in. A good example here would be John Deere, right? John Deere tractors recently said, you can't alter our firmware in our tractors, right? See what I mean? Firmware is eating the world. It's in tractors, right? So you're not allowed to alter these tractors, and that means you can't innovate and do new things and fix your own products. You, you get more and more expensive accidents. And we see that in many different ways. I also work with insurance, right? And we're seeing that the number of car crashes are going down as we automate things and give drivers better, safer cars. But the cost of crashes is going up. Anybody want to theorize why? I want to make sure you're still awake before lunch. No? No theories? Our theory is it's the cost of the components. In the bumper now, you have a LiDAR sensor, you have a camera for when you're reversing your car, you have different forms of lights and different sensors to track different positions on the road because they're getting ready to make these vehicles automated. So the cost is going up because of the electronic components you have to replace at the same time that the cars are getting safer. So we have these weird effects that we need to watch out for. So, vendors can self-certify, looking for their CE mark, you know? We don't often look at these CE marks as hackers. We don't usually think about it. But one of the things the CE mark says is that you, as a vendor, acquiring the CE mark, should apply relevant standards to your product. Here's a radical idea. There's a standard for vulnerability disclosure. And that standard says that you should have an email address that I can write to your company and send you vulnerabilities. That happens to now be an ISO standard due to the work of Katie Musaris and a bunch of other people who really spent years trying to get that into place. Well, that could apply to the CE mark. Next time you look at a CE mark, think to yourself, does this company have a vulnerabilities at, security at, email address? If they don't, they're not applying a relevant standard. And you could send that as a complaint to the CE mark to ask them why they don't have a security team. Just an idea. So secure development lifecycle, vulnerability management, also ISO standards, right? Work towards creating some pan-European or even individually European uh, engineering agency to support policymakers in this space. Extending the product liability directive to services, to understand services for the future. The NIS directive is coming up. I understand we have a better, a better presentation than mine about the NIS directive. Um, but we can use it to report breaches and vulnerabilities to safety regulators and to users. <clears throat> One of the big problems in this space is that users have a market for lemons. They don't know how to investigate the security of a product. We all know this, right? Our friends come to us and say, can you clean up my machine for viruses? Which phone should I use that's the most secure? Which app should I use that's the most secure? And we'd like to be able to answer them, but usually we don't have the time to investigate this ourselves. So who is going to investigate this? You know, who's going who's to provide the which car is the safest from a cybersecurity and privacy perspective? Another example from cars, um, I was recently at a BMW um, conference of security professionals, and they've been offering a service for many, many years to delete user data from your car before you sell it. Almost no one uses this service. <laughs> And they offer it because, you know, people had complaints about the privacy of the car, and so they create this service, and then no one uses it. How does that play out in the future when you buy someone else's car and you see everywhere they've been in the last 10 years? So, phones and laptops, patch them monthly, but make them obsolete quickly so you don't have to support 100 different models. That's, that's the, the world we live in, the realistic world that we live in. Cars and medical devices, we test them to death, pardon the pun, before release, but don't connect them to the internet, and almost never patch them once they're there. Um, but just connecting, not connecting an individual machine to the internet doesn't do us much good if the machine next door can be used as a pivot point. So this uh, don't connect it to the internet stuff doesn't really play very well with me, partly because my master's thesis was finding 10,000 industrial systems connected to the internet after everyone told me they were never connected to the internet. Right? <clears throat> 
So what happens to the support costs now that we're going to start patching cars? It's the costs are going to go up. Your insurance is going to go up because it costs more when you do have a crash, right? And you're paying for these really weird events instead of the small ones. Um, by the way, I don't have a Nexus 5X. That's, that's Ross's, and I have forgotten to update this slide. But the point is, the car will get patches only until 2018. Can you imagine buying a car and it's only supported for a few years? What does that look like, by the way? I know I've switched to Android, but I'm using this as an example. I love this graph. It was produced in an academic paper by some friends of mine who've been working on Android uh, mobile security. And I use it from, to try and explain something that I know to be true from my penetration testing days, right? Essentially, if you say, I don't know what is secure at the beginning of the project, but I know that if there's a vulnerability that's released, forget zero days, but if there's a vulnerability that has been reported, am I patched against that vulnerability or not? That's this graph. And as a penetration tester, I was able to tell people, you're almost always insecure. You, you can't really be patched up to date as much as you think you can. You try for an individual system, but can you do it for all systems and for everything in your enterprise? Why does this happen? Different ISPs and telecom providers push out patches at different rates for different things. And they do their best, but this is the sort of situation that they end up in. Over this course of time, Android was continually vulnerable. So this is the number of users, proportionally, that were patched up to the latest patch. And as you can see, new vulnerability comes out, and then they have to wait a little while, right? So, the, so at the national level, this is the attack surface that you're dealing with. Do you want to do this for cars, for medical devices, for industrial systems, for railways, over and over and over again? What about the economics, right? Cars last a long time. Trains last a long time. Trams, uh, nuclear power plants, electrical substations, sewage substations, things people don't think about, the SEPS pipeline under Europe. All of these things need to last 10, 20, 30 years. So our security needs to last. Vehicle makers might like to scrap it after seven years and buy a new one. They would love that, right? And I'm sure that the industrial systems manufacturers would love that too. But we need to be able to buy devices that last a while. Maybe they're not patched up to the highest level, but we know how to manage the vulnerabilities we've got. That's going to be, going to be core. And then, of course, a lot of these goods are no longer desktops. They're not locked into a single environment. They travel the world. They end up in different places, right? When I buy a secondhand vehicle in Kenya, I want it to be able to work. I don't want it to fail because it can't reach the internet. I don't think that's reasonable for a product. So this will have some implication for research and development. We're looking into stable tool chains, uh, clear, open tool chains that will help us fix these things. Uh, Ross has been teaching crypto classes. I've been teaching the vulnerability management um, class at Cambridge for the last three or four years. I think they asked me to do that because I've been on all sides of the equation. I work for a vendor and I manage the vulnerabilities coming in. I've worked with CERT teams to judge other people's vulnerabilities for other vendors. And I've, you know, dropped a few vulnerabilities on vendors myself over the years. Um, so I teach this class about vulnerability management. And most of them stop paying attention to the vulnerability a week, two weeks, two months, six months after it's out. But if you go and look at the statistics of how people get hacked, it's usually the same five vulnerabilities over and over and over again because they're still useful, right? Patching has a half-life. It's not enough just to patch. You know, the vendor stops at the patch is released instead of 80% penetration of patch across the enterprise. In control systems, we see this problem all the time, right? In Android, they've learned about motivating OEMs to patch products that they no longer sell. Is that something we're willing to pay for? Does it need to be regulated? Do we need to think about it? Does liability push us towards that place or push us away from that place? These are the questions I hope you go away with. I don't want to give this presentation as if I have all the answers because I don't. What I want is for you to talk about all of these things and have your own opinions. No, liability won't work and we shouldn't do regulation and we should do this and we should do that. Fine. Point is you need to make secure devices for 40 or 50 years into the future. Those are the products that we need, and we need to build an education and research environment that supports that. So safety and security, 
um, are important to teach together, Murphy and Malice. They seem to be separate, but in fact, they're often interlinked. I've abused safety systems in the past to cause problems with industrial systems. <coughs> Um, we're looking at making the tool chain more sustainable over time so that you can keep using the same tools to reverse engineer code years and years and years in the future. Uh, can we stop compiler writers from embedding backdoors into compilers? Are there better ways for programmers to communicate and document their intent so that we can see in the future what their goals were when they were writing the code and be able to analyze it a little bit better with static analysis? If durable goods we're designing today are still working in 2037, then things must change, right? Computer science has traditionally been managing complexity and has gone through all sorts of amazing histories. It's not really even reasonable for me to try and cover the history of computing languages in this presentation, but you understand the, the approach, right? All right, so conclusions. I'll stop boring you and let you ask me difficult questions and yourselves difficult questions too. Some vulns are foreseeable, and I think tools are the way to describe whether or not they're foreseeable to someone who doesn't hack or understand hacking. As software eats the world, traditional product liability is being eroded. Are we comfortable with that? It's one thing to say that software shouldn't be liable. That's fine. But when products run software, are we going to give up traditional product liability? That's the bit that bothers me. Could liability and co-vigilance help? Can cert teams tell us which products are used most often to compromise most people and thus have a discussion with the regulator about what should be done? And in, you know, in conclusion, there at the end, if you want to change the world, take your vulnerabilities to a regulator and have some discussions instead of just, um, yeah, I'll leave that there. So the paper is here, if you want to have a look at it. Um, there's the version on the European Commission's website. Um, there's a version that's been written for the workshop on economics of information security. You can have a look at those two papers. There are many other papers about product liability and software, um, and most of those papers are much better. But we did our best, and we spent a few months on this, doing some research into these different things. And we focus particularly on Europe, so it should be relevant for all of you here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk, and later on I'll be talking about something a little bit more technical, which is uh, calculating the max reflected DDoS of IPv4 internet. So thanks for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take questions for sort of 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. I have a question. Janus Irbet at the group. The question is, uh, I think last year, Bitcoin became commodity in the US. So how safe and how secure is cryptocurrency? The leading one, the other upcomers, in Ooh. your opinion? Well, OK. Um, I don't feel qualified to come, you know, comment entirely on the, uh, the safety and security of all different cryptocurrencies. <laughs> it's kind of a big topic. I have looked a little bit into Bitcoin. Um, I think regardless of whether it's a safe and secure currency, people are going to use it, which is the same with all the currencies that we have currently, right? So people will just continue to use it. Um, you know, the blockchain itself, I'm reasonably confident and comfortable about, although we have seen some price manipulation papers uh, at the workshop of economics and information security, and it was a very good paper. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I can, I can give it to you later if you come up to me afterwards. Um, so there's some price manipulation that's going on there, there's price manipulation in other markets too, right? Um, I know some people are moving from Bitcoin to Monero for ransomware and going in different directions, and that's basically what we expect. The more we surveil one currency, the more they'll move to another currency, right? Um, and people will always be ripped off in transactions. So I think the Bitcoin wallets are where I see the problems most, you know? There should be some standard of uh, static analysis checking of Bitcoin wallets. That would be radical. <laughs> Sorry, not a clear answer. I, I think they're safe enough for use, but not safe enough for the future, right? Hello, I'm Carlos with CertLV. And uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, enforcement uh, and the differences between the EU and the states. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the cars is a good example, and the diesel gate, the dirty mm -hmm. Volkswagen right. engines. Like, uh, Volkswagen had to buy back all their... Uh, diesel cars which were uh, 
uh, kind of faulty in the States, while mm -hmm. in, the, in the Europe, like you basically have to hang a CD disc on your rear view mirror and hope that it's fine or something like that. So I don't know, like on one side, it, like the enforcement of policy works, on the other side, it doesn't, do you know, yeah. if any, like why and how we should change it or should we or I don't know. I mean, for this particular paper, we focused on whether or not it was possible to do liability in Europe under current conditions and what, would, what the barriers were from a technician's point of view that would assist things. When it comes to enforcement, we didn't get that far. But I would say, yes, that would be another paper that I'd love to see in the space about comparisons. Um, one of the beautiful things about the US and, and Europe is the differences and how you can study them. So I think um, comparing our enforcement capabilities here with those in the US and the effect that has on liability would be, yeah, very important. I mean, I know the FTC has sued D-Link over vulnerabilities in some of their products. So the US does go that way sometimes, but it's much more of a litigious court case in the sense that they're trying to cost money or make money rather than just see a change in the, in the system, which I think is more aligned with EU safety regulators, right? Um, but I guess we will have a problem with enforcing this, right? We won't be able to enforce it for every IoT device, it's pretty clear. So we just have to enforce it in a way that shows that we're serious about it for the future. Yeah, that's my best answer. But ripe for further research, so, yeah. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, a different way of looking at enforcement is the issue of buyers of ICT having requirements uh, in their contracts. So what would you recommend would be the appropriate kind of provision to make sure that a provider uh, is doing the kinds of testing for vulnerabilities? Uh, you mentioned that manufacturer, but presumably across the life cycle of the product, uh, do you see something like some of the international scoring systems for weaknesses and vulnerabilities, such as CVSS, where you would require uh, that the provider uh, notify of uh, higher risk vulnerabilities, such as CVSS 7 and above, and have communication for lower risk uh, vulnerabilities? That's a fantastic question, and there's a couple of different parts of it, so I'll kind of unpick and get back to the CVEs or CVSS. Um, First of all, procurement language is fantastic, and I see that in multiple environments. So in the industrial systems environment, there are people working on uh, training people who purchase systems to ask at the pure procurement stage contractually for certain things to exist so that they have a software development life cycle, they publish the number of vulnerabilities they remediate every month, um, they update you on when the patches are out, you know, these kinds of things. So, so I, th I see those strategies of, um, affecting procurement language as being very, very useful. And in fact, that would prevent regulation. Like if every company really enforced that to the level that they should contractually, then we probably wouldn't need to go this route of liability and regulation. The problem is uh, training everyone to do that. Not every person who purchases software has security professionals on their side. A good example of that was um, I worked with BP for a little while. They paid for my master's at Cambridge. And um, so I, would, I got an insight into how they did things as a company during that process, and it was wonderful. One of the things they did was took all their vendors and said, we're going to penetration test all of your products, <clears throat> and whoever does the best, we're going to take the five of you, and you're on our procurement list for the next uh, 10 years, and the rest of you are cut off. Now, they can do that because they have a lot of money, but a smaller company doesn't necessarily have that leverage, and that's where sometimes the regulation or the liability might come into play as well. Um, but it certainly helps to focus on that procurement language. Now, going back to your, your um, premise about CVEs and CVSS, that's fantastic. I'd love to see something like that in most procurement language that says, you will inform us of any vulnerability above this level. I worry that they might game the stats. I don't worry too much. That'll be fine. We'll live with that. Um, but I also worry that CVEs and CVSS are not standardized as well, going back to our problems of standardization. So we have uh, you know, the NVD in the US. We have a couple different CVE search uh, engines here in, in Europe. And then you know, China keeps their own list and Russia keeps their own list. And the lists don't match up. We're still not clear about which vulnerabilities are which. 
when we translate to other countries. So a globalized list of vulnerabilities that matches nicely uh, doesn't yet exist. So standardization problems in that space uh, as well. Thank you. I'm Lisa Peist and I'm with the Estonian Information System Authority. Fantastic. And in terms of addressing the supply chain issues that you mentioned, mm -hmm. how much do you think a European certification approach would be useful and doable? And particularly, how much can a pan-European approach be even talked about in a world where we have very strong authorities, mm -hmm. such as BSI and ANSI, and we have small nations such as this one and mine, mm -hmm. which couldn't possibly ever start to dream about that. Right. Um, well, that's one of the wonderful things about the EU, uh, in my opinion. I know there's some sort of deep irony about someone from the UK talking about how great the EU is, but, um, but they've been, you know, working on standardizing and harmonizing product liability across Europe for 30, 40 years, right? More? So it's not a new problem. They're used to the fact that some countries have larger and smaller budgets. They're used to the fact that the laws are different in different countries. But to harmonize them and get a standardized kind of approach is what is helpful, right? The other thing is, whether you're a small country or a big country, with IoT, I'm not sure it matters as much. If you're buying all of your products from Indonesia or somewhere else in the world, they're coming to multiple countries in Europe. It's a common market, right? So if they're selling it in Latvia or Estonia, they're probably selling it in France. And this means that the regulators can coordinate a little bit about what, what the big problems, problem areas uh, are. I do think there's a lot of power there. I don't necessarily think we need to completely overhaul the entire system and set up completely new initiatives. Start with the initiatives we've got, which is why I highlighted the CE mark. What can we do with the CE mark today as it stands to promote upstream supply chain security? And I think there are some things we can do there, some very, very simple things. Um, so I think if we just kind of leverage what we've already got, uh, we'll, we'll make some progress. And I would say you should speak to the Norwegian uh, Consumer Product Council. Uh, they're doing some great work in testing uh, toys and other things for vulnerabilities and then pushing back on the vendors uh, through these kinds of approaches. So there's, there's a large chance of progress here, even for small countries. Anyone else? Oh, it's been a lot of information, <laughs> very thought-provoking. Uh, my feeling and opinion is that there, are, there is a hope, but it's a long, very long road. Mm. And uh, we'll have to talk about this much more in the yeah. future. This is just the beginning. It's feasible, apparently, mm. to do something in this area, but it will not be easy. So, last call for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.